a, a what is the end game here? Well, we're in, we're we are make no mistake. Uh, well, you are. I'm out because I sold like, but you guys are in the middle of an enormous uh, multivariate kind of Ponzi scheme. Start over. It has to be intuitive, precognitive. I mean, I wanted to know what you want to do before you even know you want to do it. Wait, are we still talking about the command prompts? Bill, we're talking about everything. The whole thing. Lisa. The young CEOs of today are afraid of going public. I think two things change. One, there's never been access to private capital like this. So I'm not sure if we would see some of the largest companies in the world today. If they were starting today, I'm not sure you would see them going public as soon as they did. They had no other choice. The minute that you start having to report publicly, you have to start playing games with your numbers, you have to start playing games with your growth, and, you, and usually the person that loses in that situation is the consumer. So if we're trying to create extraordinary experiences for consumers over time, the longer those companies can stay private, and by Masa coming in and enabling that, the more unbelievable the experience and more life-changing the experience will be for people. Because it's got bravado. It's social status. No, you know what? It's even more than that. It's social currency. We've raised the bar. And if we want to stay there, we got to risk everything. Uh, and if you are 50% owner, 51% owner, owner of that company, the debt in accounting get consolidated into the parents. Uh, but parents' debt, soft and group debt is actually roughly $4 billion. Our asset is uh, $25 billion. So $25 billion asset minus $4 billion debt. That's a healthy, healthy situation and uh, lots of uh, excess value that we have. Right. Great artists, Dylan, Picasso, Newton, they risk failure. And if we want to be great, we got to risk it, too. On the command bar? On everything. You get courted by investors, OK? These are not people writing checks out of their own balance sheet. They're doing a job with other people's money. And for that, they get one thing that's obvious, which is a yearly fee. And then something that's non-obvious, which is a part of the gains if what you do works. Okay, right, everybody understands that. That's how a fund that invests in you works. That fund is getting paid fees every year and then carry at the back end if it works, okay? Well, you know, I still want to invest more and I want to increase. Uh, some of my investors said, Masa, you, you get too excited and too much concentration into one company. Don't go too far too much, but and then they give you, I'm just gonna make up a number, a million bucks. And then you go to your first board meeting. How fast are you growing? How many of you have had these discussions? How fast are you growing? Okay, grow faster. How many of you have had that discussion? Grow faster. Would you please explain why we each found some random Chinese guy asleep in our beds? Yes, you work all day. Your rooms are always empty, so they use. The fuck they do. Yeah. So they try to understand how to put your valuation into context. I mean, should you be valued as a real estate company or as a technology company? So we actually don't view ourselves as a real estate company or as a technology company. We used to say that we're a community company, but we're starting to figure out now that we ourselves are still discovering what is that best type of company that we want to be. Well, it looks like the end could be near for a company that was once hyped not very long ago, as the most valuable startup in the world. WeWork is the name of it, and earlier this year, the company was valued at almost $50 billion. The ever-obedient business press often described WeWork as a tech company, but that was never really right. It was actually a real estate operation of sorts. WeWork bought up office space in big cities and then rented it to individuals or small companies. Now, that's fine, I guess, but it's hardly a revolutionary idea, and investors always want more flash. So the CEO of the company, Adam Newman, posed as a world-transforming CEO. He babbled about making himself immortal or becoming the first ever trillionaire or using WeWork to solve world hunger somehow. 
And then we have for-profit companies that are making things, if it's, let's say, things that are made of wood and they're cutting a lot of trees to get there, and why is the fact that you can make money from cutting trees making you for-profit? So what we're really doing is we're taking best practices out of the for-profit world, best practices out of the non-for-profit world, bringing those two things together, that's the type of company that we're going to be. We really want to be a company that sets an example but also lives by their own words. Just saying, will you stop the WeWork deal, please? Let's stop WeWork. Nobody has heard from Marlick in months. This isn't working. I'm gonna drag your cousin the fuck out of my lair. No, this is my cousin. Bill, if you don't share our enthusiasm and care for the vision of this company. No, 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 I just, I, I'm not understanding. Get out. What? Get your shit and get out. What, 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 You're done. What, what are you gonna, you gonna fire me? No! I already fired you! Why are you still here? And as much as I like Newman, it doesn't matter. That's the zeitgeist of right now, is people are just talking, give me a break. We were, give me a break. Okay, most of you that, that raised your hand. Well, it would, it would probably shock you to know that almost 40 cents of every venture dollar right now goes right back into the hands of Google, Facebook, and Amazon. What do you think is happening there? You think that's all profitable growth? No. That's there to fund your superficial growth. Uh, I'm just, I just think it's wonderful to see the U.S. economy growing again over 4%. I think our big competitor uh, is China. If we let China's economy pass us up, uh, if we let uh, China develop, you know, produce more engineers than we do, uh, if we let China, China's technology companies beat our technology companies, it won't be long that, that our military is behind technologically also. Right. Our economy is behind technologically. We have a serious competition going on with, with uh, China. I'm on Team USA. I would like us to be successful. I'd like us to develop and protect our technologies. I think we have to do that. I think we have to in, in, invest um, uh, invest in our economy and grow our economy so we can compete with the first serious uh, the fir first serious threat if you will or first serious competitor uh, we've had uh, since uh, the 1930s China's marathon strategy mm -hmm. depends heavily on goodwill from other countries especially the United States that goodwill translates into massive foreign investment the acceptance of Chinese exports indulgences when the government or state affiliated organizations are caught stealing technology or, viting, or violating WTO rules and looking the other way on human rights abuses. Western countries offer such concessions primarily because their leaders are convinced that overall China is moving in the right direction toward freer markets, productive international cooperation, and political liberalization. Uh, let me just um, shift and ask uh, about uh, our challenge in emerging technologies, cyber and space, in particular China's investment in those areas and uh, our uh, eroding advantage. Uh, I was struck, uh, Mr. Secretary, by a comment that you make in your written testimony. You say some U.S. companies have voiced ethical qualms about working with DOD to develop advanced technology, in some cases even terminating relationships, often while continuing to work with China. What are we talking about here? talking about Google and their support to China and their lack of support to the Department of Defense. And so, you throw into that what the book is really about is our secret cooperation with China uh, through CIA and the Pentagon, a lot of things we did together during the Cold War that in many ways taught our intelligence community and our military not to see China as an enemy. And they've exploited that that wishful thinking as well. Even as they do things that only an enemy would do, they keep denying it and we keep believing them. This is, I think, the dilemma uh, President Trump faces today. So China can register and list their stocks on our exchanges and our, our retirement investment investment officers can send money over to China and they don't have to co correspond to the same rules that U.S. companies have to. So make Chinese companies correspond to the exact same rules that U.S. companies have to, and I'll tell you why they won't. Because sending over the audit data is a national security violation in China. 
In other words, it is treason yeah. for you to send the audit information from a Chinese company to the U.S. It is about controlling what you think and how you speak about the word China and the Chinese people. So now, even in the United States or in China, when you say China dot dot dot, what comes after that is a Chinese Communist Party talking point. The narrative that says, for example, if you bring up things like concentration camps for Uyghurs or forced organ, organ harvesting, or the fact that Confucius Institutes do censorship of speech and suppression of religion on university campuses in, in the, the United, United States, States. in yep. the United States, yep. you are being racist, right? That is a Chinese Communist Party talking point. I've experienced it many times. We applauded you in 2010 when Google took a very powerful stand of a principle and democratic values over profits and came out of China. I am concerned that you are now going back into China and upholding the dragonfly uh, procedures which would help censor Chinese persons seeking a lifeline of democracy and freedom. How can you do that and what are you doing to minimize or to indicate that this is not uh, best practices. Congressman, at the outset, uh, right now we have no plans to launch in China. We, have, we don't have a search product there. Uh, our, our core mission is to provide users access to information, and getting access to information is an important human right, so we are always compelled across the world uh, to try hard to provide that information. And, but right now there are no plans to launch search in China. We contacted Google about these remarkable emails, and the reply to us is here in full, quote, These emails were just a brainstorm of ideas, none of which were ever implemented. Google has never manipulated its search results or modified any of its products to promote a particular political ideology, not in the current campaign season, not during the 2016 election, and not in the aftermath of President Trump's executive order on immigration. Our processes and policies would not have allowed for any manipulation of search results to promote political ideologies, end quote. Left unanswered by Google was why anyone would believe that statement for a second. Nor did Google say anything about the employees on that email chain. Presumably they still work at Google, which is remarkable. If you ran a bank and caught your tellers brainstorming about how to rob the vault, would they still work for you? Remember that Google fired an engineer called James Damore last summer. Almost instantly, the CEO flew back from family vacation to fire him. Why? because Damore was caught expressing mildly conservative ideas in a private memo. Here, Google employees are plotting to subvert our entire public conversation secretly, but that's fine with Google. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem, step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. Google is biasing search. And the way in which they're able to say we don't bias search is how they bias search. So people need to look up ML fairness, machine learning fairness. Google has released a video and they talk about their need to unbias search. That's how the bias is coming significant that China's intelligence agencies have been seeding people into American companies. I want to ask you about what's going on in Silicon Valley in terms of espionage, in terms of what's happening with Chinese nationals working within our companies. There are Confucius Institutes in Silicon Valley, right, by Stanford University. What's your take on all of that? Yang, there better not be a Chinaman in my bed. That is a racist. Yes. I am racist. 
zero in on the Google uh, example where the AI DeepMind effort was described by its own founder as a Manhattan project for AI. And so even though this was meant as probably, you know, marketing hyperbole in a way. Eric is gone. This is my incubator now. What? Your things are over there. What the fuck? Go for You are racist and a richer. You are ugly. The Eric administration is over. What? What the fuck? You can't just kick us out, Jin Yang. Sorry. You are victims of a circumstance. We swear to give this committee the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Please be seated. About this. Well, Mr. Zuckerberg, I will say there are a great many Americans who I think are deeply concerned that, that Facebook and other tech companies are engaged in a pervasive pattern of bias and political censorship. Chairman Burr, Vice Chairman Warner, and members of the Select Committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. My written testimony goes into more detail about the actions we're taking to prevent election interference on Facebook. But I wanted to start by explaining how seriously we take these issues and talk about some of the steps we're taking. I'm someone of very few words and typically pretty shy. And I realize how important it is to speak up now. If it's okay with all of you, I'd like to read you something I personally wrote as I considered these issues. I'm also going to tweet this out now. <laughs> We've learned from 2016 and more recently from other nations' elections how to protect the integrity of elections. Better tools, stronger policy, and new partnerships are already in place. Senator, let me say a few things about this. First, I understand where that concern is coming from because Facebook and the tech industry are located in Silicon Valley, which is an extremely left-leaning place. And uh, I, this is actually a concern that I have and that I try to root out in the company is making sure that we don't have um, any bias in the work that we do. And uh, no, Senator, we do not generally ask people about their political orientation when they're joining the company. So as CEO, have you ever made hiring or firing decisions based on political positions or what candidates they supported? No. Why was Palmer Lucky fired? Here to comment is Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Hello, Colin. Begin eye contact. Two, three, and away. <laughs> Nailed it. Wow. Yeah, that, was, that was great, Mark. Thanks for being here. You know, a lot of people now are calling on you to resign from Facebook. Are you going to step down? No way, homie. Because according to our data sets, I don't have to, and you can't make me. You or anyone at Facebook been interviewed by the special counsel's office? Yes. Have you been interviewed? I have not. I, I, I have not. Others have. I, I believe so, and I want to be careful here because that our work with the special counsel is confidential, and I want to make sure that in an open session I'm not revealing something that's mm -hmm. confidential. I understand. Today, Google is more than a search engine. We are a global company that's committed to building products for everyone. That means working with many industries, from education and healthcare to manufacturing and entertainment. Even as we expand into new markets, we never forget our American roots. It's no coincidence that a company dedicated to free flow of information was founded right here in the U.S. Your argument about other countries and America's competitiveness is similar to an argument Mark Zuckerberg has made. Basically, we're going to do it or China's going to do it. Is that essentially what you're saying? Don't, don't stifle this growth in America or it will go elsewhere? You know, it, it could, you know, when being in Silicon Valley, for example, I always think, I mean, you can't take for granted uh, that you will always be successful. I think you have to earn it. Uh, you know, now there are many countries around the world which aspire to be the next Silicon Valley, and they are supporting their companies yeah. too. And so my point is, the incentives in this industry are the most out of whack they've ever been. Mm. It's a bit of a charade. So my point is, I looked at our portfolio, we have some incredible businesses. We have things that are really meaningful in the world. We have both. And I'm like, it's time to shake my chips off the table. Sorry. Ciao. Yes. Jin Yang, are you, are you copying all those companies for the Chinese markets? Oh, no. Fuck you, Stefan. Mm -hmm. 